here, but welcome to our Tundra Talk and our conversation here this evening with our new executive director, Peter Windsor. My name is Lois Norgard and I'm the national field organizer here at the league. So I work with all of you guys on anything you might need, information, um, questions, anything you might want to do as actions across the nation, um, just rely on me for support and help there. Um, my office is in the state now known as Minnesota. It is the traditional home of the Dakota, Anishinaabe, and Ho-Chunk peoples. And my office directly is in Bloomington, Minnesota, which is the traditional territory of the Dakota peoples. Before I start a conversation off, there's a few quick housekeeping items I'd like to help you get the most out of your evening here with us tonight. So as you can see, all participants will be muted to help assure everyone has the best listening experience possible. I will kick us off for an introduction and some storytelling, but we will have plenty of time to field your questions after that. So please do type in any questions you might have in the chat at any point this evening. You can also indicate you have a question using the raise hand feature. It is part of the Zoom um, toolbox that's at the bottom of your screen. You can find it there. Um, right at the very right side, there is something that says reactions. That button, if you click on it, will get you to a raise hand feature. And it's really helpful for you to do the raise hand because that way you get moved to the front of the line. I'm able to see you in case we have so many people that I can't see everyone on the screen. I will then watch for this and unmute you and it is helpful. Yeah, it's super helpful to use that option. Before introducing our guest of honor tonight, though, I'd like to introduce you to Chris Konish, our Director of Development. Chris is helping with fielding questions here tonight for us. Hi, hey everyone. Good to see some familiar names. Um, I'm, I'm joining everyone here from Washington, D.C., the traditional lands of the uh, Piscataway and Anacostan peoples, and I'm thrilled to, to be here to help introduce our, our new director who's been with us for a few months now, still, still getting his sea legs, as we like to say, but um, I think those are well established based on his background. Um, as Lois has said, I'll keep an eye on the chat. Feel free to ping me if, if there's anything that you'd like to, like me to raise. Um, and otherwise, uh, welcome, enjoy. Yeah, thanks, Chris. And um, now we'll introduce our guest of honor, Peter Windsor. Dr. Peter Windsor grew up in the west coast of Sweden and early on developed a love for nature and the outdoors and has a lot of adventures that he, we'll hear about this evening. Um, and tell some stories, storytelling. And I just want, he prepared some images that we'd like to show you. So I will share my screen and pull up a few pictures. So Peter, just when you're ready to move to the next page, just let me know and I will move us through and then we can get back to our panel and kind of have more of a conversation. Um, so with that, I'm going to share the screen, pass the mic to Peter. Thank you so much, Lewis. I appreciate it. And hello, everyone. It's uh, it's great to be here to share this evening with you. It's uh, 4 p.m. here in Alaska, Fairbanks in interior Alaska. We have eternal sunshine nowadays up here. So it's uh, the sun is high in the sky. My bees are out flying, collecting pollen from the local willows. And it's just a gorgeous day here in the mid 70s. Um, it's really exciting to meet you all, and uh, I look forward to fielding any questions and uh, try to provide good answers to those. And please be as curious as you can possibly be. I love questions. There's no wrong or silly questions in my world. So just fire away whenever you want to. And uh, Luis, you can switch slides if you so will. And yeah, I was asked to share a couple of stories. I, I've been in the science field in, in oceanography, climate research for the last 25 years or so, and uh, been working basically all over the world, but mostly in Arctic and Antarctica. And uh, it's uh, throughout that work and before uh, arriving here at AWL, I've been been basically uh, performing a lot of exciting field work. I spent a lot of time here in Alaska. I lived in Fairbanks for the last 14 years. And uh, I would like to share some of the stories with you and hopefully you find some of them exciting. Uh, and Luis, are we? Yeah, I'm so sorry. Too? For some reason, I couldn't get the slides to move. So I will try to share again. Apologize, Peter, for that. But No worries at all. We will make sure that we 
get back into that. While you rummage around there, Louis, I, I can share a little bit about my background. Um, I grew up in Sweden and got my PhD in oceanography there. I was actually a high school dropout, which is not something I typically <laughs> bassoon out publicly, but uh, once I got uh, <laughs> some maturity on my legs, I uh, did the mandatory military service in Sweden, and then I uh, stepped right into a PhD program in oceanography. My advisor was an Arctic oceanographer, so I ended up doing a, uh, climate ice ocean research in the Arctic on the Swedish icebreaker Odin. Did a lot of trips to the North Pole, geographical North Pole. And from there, I moved to the US in 2002, where I became a scientist at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution in Massachusetts, Cape Cod. And I taught at the MIT Woods Hole Joint Program uh, for about six, seven years. And then I moved up here to Fairbanks, Alaska, where I started a major lab in uh, oceanography lab at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, and I've been there from uh, 08 to 2018, where my research and interest led me more to terrestrial and people uh, issues, uh, especially ecosystem function and ecosystem impacts on climate change on ecosystems. And then I took over the role as the global director at WWF for their Panarctic Global Program, and recently joined WWF. And this is really uh, a, a privilege and a really a dream job for me to work with this really excellent team at AWL and with all of you to work on these extremely critical issues we have for the Arctic. So that's that's how I ended up here in a one or two minute summary, Louis. And <laughs> yeah, you... thanks. I think we're good now. I'll move to the next image if that works. Super. We'll ah. see. Well, I did it a minute ago. Gosh, I'm not sure what's going on here. While you do that, I can talk about this picture in front of us. That's obviously me. And in the background are the mountains of Seward, Alaska. Oh, there we go. There we go, sorry. And not far from there is, is this place. So um, uh, apart from doing uh, research and, and now working full speed ahead with the AWL and its team, I, uh, on my personal time, I spend a lot of time outdoors. I'm an avid climber, alpinist, uh, backcountry skier. I like to float rivers, do long distance hiking and uh, through hikes. And uh, I live here with my partner and family in Fairbanks and we do all sorts of subsistence lifestyle. I, uh, we beekeep, we hunt caribou in the fall, we pick berries, we fish for salmon uh, during the fishing season, which is coming up soon. And we tap birches for syrup and basically try to live off the land as much as we can with the smallest amount of ecological impact and a small footprint. Uh, so that's, uh, that's a lifestyle that's uh, fairly easy to adopt here in Alaska, not necessarily so easy if you live downtown LA, but uh, up here, one of the beautiful things about living in the interior of Alaska is that it's uh, fairly uncrowded and lots of wildlife and nature all around us. And just north of me here in Fairbanks is uh, the Brooks Range and some of the areas that we work on most intensely at the AWL and I'll speak about that in a while. This picture here is, uh, you can go back one, this picture here is just one of my backcountry trips with my partner Hank, who's been a ski and climbing partner buddy of mine for a long, long time. Uh, this is actually not far from Anchorage, it's up by something called the Snowboard Hut. It's a hut maintained by the American Alpine Club. And uh, you can see in the background there is a big, what's called a nunatak, which is a big rock formation that splits a glacier into two flows. And we were able to go in here very early season this year. No one had been to the hut and we had, we typically camp out. So we weren't used to huts. Uh, there are very few huts up here in the Fairbanks area. We heard rumors that there was a heater in the hut. So we brought very few clothes and no uh, heating fuel. And uh, turns out that there was no heating in the few hut at all. So we were basically wearing all our clothes for the three nights we spent here and shivering away at night and being pretty miserable. But in the daytime, we could ski and keep our, our um, body heat up. And this is a very fairly remote area to get to with some high avalanche danger to get in there. So it's a really one of those places where you can hear the silence literally 
and the star gazing up here is absolutely phenomenal. No light pollution and no people up here at all. So uh, again, you don't need to go too far anywhere in Alaska to find this kind of solitude. And uh, best to spend those uh, time in those areas with uh, capable partners. And my friend Hank has been one of those for a long time. You can go to the next slide, Louis. Uh, here's another picture. We're now switching places. We're going from the northern tip of the globe to the southern tip. This is Antarctica. This is a fjord called Anvard Fjord. And uh, I had a big field project here funded by the National Science Foundation studying how climate change is affecting glaciers and the ocean and the whole oceanographic ecosystem in these fjord systems in Antarctica. These are some of the most dramatically warming areas on Earth, together with Alaska, uh, the Western Antarctic Peninsula, which is right across Drake State, Drake Passage, uh, is one of the most warming areas, quickest warming areas on Earth. And uh, our little home, the icebreaker is in the background there. That's the icebreaker Palmer, which is one of two icebreakers that the National Science Foundation operates in Antarctica. And the captain was fairly nervous about us going here. You have to go here in a small inflatable Zodiac. And for this particular uh, project, my colleague here, Martin Trooper, uh, is installing a tripod. And on there, we put a time-lapse camera who's pointing at the glacier that you can't see in this picture. Um, the captain was nervous for a number of reasons. Two, he didn't like us to leave the icebreaker. <laughs> and two, uh, we had to climb actually to get up to this location because we wanted an overlook view down on the glacier. So with the time-lapse camera taking pictures every 30 seconds, we can estimate how much ice is calving off the glacier into the fjord, which is one measure of how quickly the glaciers are changing down here. And uh, this particular glacier is calving about 10 meters of glacier every day. So it's an enormous movement in these glaciers. And um, so we had to climb up here and then uh, find some bedrock and then put up this camera system. And it's, it's just a stunningly beautiful place to do field work. Lots of wildlife in the ocean down here, penguins, uh, leopard seals, whales, all over the place. And it's just a fantastic place to, to be with also some fantastically awful weather. When it's not like this, it's usually extremely windy down there. and uh, pretty challenging place to do science overall. You can switch slides, Louise. Here's another ski picture because I'm Scandinavian. We love skiing. So uh, <laughs> Louis asked me to put up some pictures and I think they're skiing on every other picture. So I apologize for this. This is uh, in my backyard, I call it. This is the Eastern Alaska Range, just south of Fairbanks. This is the Gokana, Upper Gokana Glacier. If you look there just below me, uh, some very significant crevasses. So we had to climb up the, this on our skis, backcountry skis with skins on. It's about 10 miles up the glacier. Then you have to zigzag through this maze of, of uh, crevasses to get up here. But uh, this is uh, late spring season skiing. The sun is up for a long time and snow is nice and stable. And uh, again, um, two hour drive south from Fairbanks and uh, half a day of skiing off the glacier and you're in, in this environment, which is uh, absolutely amazing to be in. Uh, there's an old science hut up here and that we were able to um, gently break into and spend the night at. Uh, we were going light, so we didn't bring a tent and then a big storm came. We, we um, did a little uh, trespassing into this science hut and we spent the night there and we uh, said that that was because of safety reasons. I think we just wanted to be dry and warm at that point. It's definitely Next. a stunning picture. Yeah, It's a beautiful place. Um, easy to get to too, if you want to. Next slide, Louise. Here's a picture that's near and dear to me. I, I spent a lot of my free time hiking in the Alaska Range, uh, both north of Fairbanks in the Brooks Range and south of Fairbanks in the Eastern Alaska Range. This is from a through hike that me and seven friends did in 2019 maybe, uh, around that. And we wanted to traverse the entire Eastern Alaska Range from the Fairbanks side to the Denali National Park side. And then you traverse under some of the biggest mountains here in Alaska, which is Mount Deborah, Hess, and Hayes. And uh, 
we were basically staring at topo maps from 1954 and trying to figure a route through uh, this mountain range from one side to the other. Um, turns out that climate change has been <laughs> wrecking havoc on most of these glaciers. So what you see in my background here on the topo map was a glacier. And when we got there, there was absolutely no glacier that was completely gone uh, since 1954. So a lot of the glacier crossings we were anticipating were basically just the terminal moraine and, and gravel. Uh, this particular hike had us go through some very hairy river crossings. And my friend got swept away on one of them and got banged up pretty severely, lost his backpack and all his uh, belongings uh, down the river. Uh, we were out there for nine days for this particular through hike and only half of our group made it uh, across and uh, half of the troop turned around and scurried home again. Uh, two were picked up by a Tundra airplane because one was injured from this river spill. But it was a really, a really remarkable uh, cross-section hike, through hike that we did and we saw an abundance of wildlife and the, probably the most Intense period was weather. We've got rain done eight up to nine days. It was brutally cold. I did the hike in uh, trail running shoes. So my feet were basically wet and cold from morning to evening every day. And uh, it snowed on us, it hailed on us. Classic Alaska weather. Uh, like we say here, if you don't like the weather, wait five minutes and it'll be something different. Uh, the most scariest thing was uh, running into two uh, grizzly cubs on the way, and we could not see the mother. And the cubs had ne probably never seen a human before. They were very curious and walked more or less up to us very close. We had one bear spray can between the four of us that were remaining at this point, and we were frantically looking for the mother. Never saw her, and eventually, after sort of a 20-minute standoff, the cubs moved along. They probably got bored sniffing at us with probably less pleasant smell at the point of this trip. <laughs> Next slide, Louis. And lastly, this is from the Brooks Range. Um, Brooks Range is a place where few people have had the luxury to go or pleasure or, or privilege. Um, the Brooks Range is uh, also amazing to visit in the winter time, where very few people go up here. Uh, this is off the so-called Dalton or Hall Road that services the Prudhoe Bay oil fields. And that's the only purpose really for this road. This is outside Wiseman and Coldfoot, which is uh, quite a ways up there. This is in February. It's uh, 25 below Fahrenheit, and we're about to climb this mountain here. These little ice runnels that look tiny are actually several hundred feet uh, tall. And me and my uh, climbing friend went up there to try to climb these ice climbs up this mountain, which is called Sukakpak. And it's, uh, it's a really stunning mountain. And the ice climbing was both difficult and very, very cold. This is really at the limit where you want to do technical ice climbing. And I froze both my hands during this climb. And when they thaw out, you get something called the screaming barfies, which is basically hurt so much when the blood returns to your hands that you either vomit or cry or cannot breathe. And that lasts for 10 to 15 minutes. I was just hanging on my rope uh, 200 feet up this ice climb and just basically trying to deal with the pain of the blood room returning to my hands. And then of course you have to continue climbing and then repel the whole thing uh, in 25 below. So that was uh, one of those uh, type two fun trips, I call them, where it's, it's a lot of fun afterwards, but during the actual uh, trip, it's, it's a little less, um, uh, li little less fun at the, at the time, but very challenging. And the, the, again, being up here in the remote areas of the Brooks Range, uh, in times of the year where really it's only you, caribou, and, and not much else being outside is, is, is really, really wonderful and uh, something I really cherish um, being up there. And I'll spell the name. Thank you. <laughs> And so those are some examples of the little adventures I've done on my spare time and or during my time as a researcher or a scientist. But um, 
uh, I'd be happy to field questions and I really want to share to you if questions come up about some of my experiences working with indigenous remote communities in Alaska and maybe also share some of the things I, where I've been fairly clumsy in that regard. <laughs> also, uh, in some interesting stories from uh, experiences interacting with people who actually live here year round in, in these extreme environments. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you, Louis. I'll stop share now and um, we can get to some questions. I, I That certainly brought some questions for me, but let's see if we have some from the audience yet. Debbie. Hi. I see Debbie. Hi, Debbie. I, I'm just curious on your uh, Alaska Range journey. Mm -hmm where your starting point was and your ending point was? Yeah, that was, uh, we started from Black Rapids, uh, Black Rapids Lodge, south of Delta Junction, yeah. uh, which is south of here. And then we hiked over and ended up in Healy. Uh, so we ended up in Denali Park, basically just north of Denali Park. So it's about, uh, oh, I don't know if I ever measure it. I'm guessing it's like maybe 130 miles or so, but with a lot of, torturous terrain. It's not like, you know, I've done some longer hikes that are more touristy hikes, I call them, like the Colorado Trail, 500 miles or so, and that's just easy hiking on a well-established trail. Uh, this is, there's nothing out here, so you have to negotiate glaciers and, and the river crossings and terrible bushwhacking in alders and all the stuff you know. Yeah, I was just, I've been to the Black Rapids area and I know where you're, mm -hmm. I know what you're talking about. And it's a lot of bushwhacking. Yep. Yep. Well, it's, uh, from there, it's like, and lots of river crossings. And oh my gosh, that's, that's a pretty epic kind of a challenge to do that. Yeah, we went on the north side of the range. Uh, people have gone on the just south of there and basically skied up the Black Rapids Glacier and then climbed across and over and then floated out in pack rafts to Denali Park. That's a fair amount of easier type of travel. That's been done as the Winter Classic too, which is a competition here in Alaska where people try to go from A to B in any means by foot. Um, so that's a well-established route. The northern side where we went, I don't think anyone or very few has, has done that traverse across. And so we were, it was basically a, a big question mark. We just tried to find a way across and we did eventually with, uh, yeah, with, with a lot of challenges and slightly hypothermic for a couple of days and that kind of good stuff. <laughs> Sounds exhilarating. Well, you know, you mentioned something about the communities here. I'd like to, I'll ask a question unless sure. there's somebody else, but um, some of the, maybe share some of the stories of working with the local communities, the indigenous communities, important things that you have learned about working mm -hmm. with indigenous communities in Alaska and kind of, um, yeah, so maybe some reflections on that. You did mention something about some awkward stories that would be fun to hear as well. Yeah, uh, happy to do that. Uh, the first thing, first thing that comes to mind is, you know, uh, being a, a, a eager professor at UF and thinking that the rest of the world uh, revolves around Western science and our pace of talking, living, and moving, and starting to work with, uh, you know, remote coastal villages such as Wainwright Point Hope Point Lay in the Chichi Sea, and uh, flying in there and uh, you know, basically being dumped off on the gravel strip and wondering where everyone is and, you know, waiting a couple of hours until someone shows up on a four-wheeler, takes you into the village and asking around for, you know, the guy we're going to meet, Bob. And, uh, you know, slowly learning that, well, you know, it's really nice that you guys showed up, but, you know, it's hunting season as Bob took up, up, up the river to go moose hunting. He'll be back in five days. And, uh, but you're welcome to hang out. And, and once he's back, I'm sure he might have some time unless he's, you know, harvesting or field dressing the moose. And that kind of, uh, you know, really figuring out that time moves at a different pace in, in Alaskan villages, that you have to sit on your hands a lot and, and listen and not talk so much and really embrace that slower pace of living. And once I 
embrace that myself, I, I, it was actually pretty, pretty wonderful experience because suddenly you also notice all the animals and wildlife around you. You're not running around like a headless chicken. You're actually quiet and you listen and just that pace and, and lifestyle and uh, even the slow pace of talking, it, it's really something that uh, I learned a lot from that. And uh, it's, it's something I really appreciate now. And uh, I also learned to, that, you, uh, yeah, you can, you can be as well-planned or think you know your stuff, but uh, I actually learned a lot more from working with these native Alaskans than I learned during most of my PhD in terms of both the ecosystems up there, the impact of climate mm -hmm. change and what's important to the people who live there, not necessarily what I was studying, oceanography or climate change. There might be concerned about just food security or mental health issues or village life. And, and uh, just, it really grounds you in a very, uh, very meaningful way. So uh, the time spent there, I spent uh, probably eight years living up or working up there every summer. It was uh, really changed the way I, I look at both ecosystems and science and, and the people connection. And uh, it's a really wonderful experience. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'm sure that's um, going to be front and center in our continuing work with Wild Alaska and the work that we do with AWL. You know, Chris, is there any yeah questions in the chat that we should? Yeah, there's been a couple of good ones. I want to um, not overlook an earlier one, but did want to connect uh, uh, to as you raised a question about New Talk, um, the, the recent Patagonia film regarding the community um, being displaced by climate change. And uh, we actually featured uh, the filmmakers and a member of the community as part of the Geography of Hope series, your first introduction for a Zoom call for us, so to speak. Um, I'd be curious to know, you know, Sue's asking if you've seen the film. Um, I'd be curious to know if you've seen some of the firsthand effects as well um, uh, in, in your own time there in Fairbanks. Yeah, uh, I've both seen the film. I thought the film was really wonderful and impactful. Um, during my time before AWL, I worked for WWF and we had a similar uh, effort where we worked with a community in the Aleutian Island change who basically fell into the ocean and they had to relocate inland and uh, coastal erosion due to diminishing ice cover, longer ice free season, more storms and more coastal erosion is, uh, is one of those unfortunate poster childs of climate change that we see in Alaska. Some areas up north along the Beaufort Sea is losing up to 10 to 20 meters of coastline every year, which is just remarkable world, well, unfortunate world record um, in coastal erosion. And uh, the community we work with in the Aleutians, uh, it's just a remarkable how resilient people are. They had to move inland. They didn't have the same access to fishing anymore. So they went on YouTube and learned how to farm and they got the cow and they learned how to milk a cow on YouTube and started to do farming and integrating now farming with some coastal and still fishing. And it's just, it's, I never met people that are as strong as the coastal community people who, who just get, uh, you know, blasted with storms, uh, their environment is changing and they're still smiling and still trying to cope with the general life. And it's, uh, it's absolutely remarkable. And the, uh, the New Talk film, I think, touches upon the same struggles and the same strength in the people who live up there. And um, it's a sort of mostly an untold story. I, I'm glad Patagonia brought it up because they have a big footprint. Uh, a lot of people from around the world follow them, but it's still you know, not headline material and, and people don't understand the scale of, of the issue that, and this is one, manifestation of climate change, one of, one of many, many. So um, yeah, in, impactful film. Yeah, thank you. I wanted to just continue on that thread and someone's asking about, um, you know, how the slower pace that you sort of learned from uh, has mm -hmm. benefited, you know, this question specific to your research, but I'd be curious, you know, how that, you see that translating as well to some of the work that you'll be doing at the league. Um, and yeah. 
That's a that's a super good question. Uh, thank you, whoever asked that. That's a highly intelligent question. Uh, I think I think we have a lot to learn at JWL, but I think through some of the work Lewis is leading with our Jedi work, which is justice, equity, diversity, inclusivity. I think we're 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 getting there, and I I'm definitely very determined to make uh, deeper meaningful connections with indigenous communities all over Alaska, including. Uh, communities and uh, tribes that may not align perfectly well with our our AWL mission. We need to have all sorts of conversations, difficult ones, easy ones, and uh, and basically learn from the people who are really the stewards of these lands. Uh, I certainly learned a lot. The slower pace question is a good one. Um, I think we learned to slow down and not be so rushed in our science. We also learned over time, this was not an instant learning. It took many years up there to actually maybe listen more to local knowledge and the, the knowledge that was already existing and try to integrate that into our Western science-based structure. And that was not easy, but it was very meaningful. I'll give you an example. I had these high, high-tech underwater autonomous vehicles or robots that I unleashed in the ocean. And they swim around for over a month on their own and they were uh, recording underwater noise, including vocalizations of marine mammals, such as bearded seals or humpback whales. And uh, the robots we designed are intelligent enough that they have a little lookup library inside them. So they can identify the call and they can tell you what species they heard. And then they go to the surface and send that information to us via satellite in real time. At the same time, they're measuring all the oceanographic variables, salinity, temperature, chlorophyll, uh, the state of the ocean, if you like. So that was, we were like, you know, stropping around feeling pretty cool about our underwater vehicles. And um, by talking to our locals and the people that we hired to work with us, uh, they basically told us a different story. And when we sort of adjusted our thinking to the local observations, which is mostly by eye, by them being out seal hunting or boating, it turned out that our data was not only sometimes incorrect, but it was also biased because the way this sensor and this robot was working. So by integrating indigenous knowledge and local knowledge from these people, we were actually able to do not only better science, but accurate science. And, and basically we went from thinking that there were very few whales or uh, around anymore to realizing that the whale population was super healthy and we couldn't have done that without our indigenous partners. Well, there's still folks chiming in, so I'm happy to keep being a voice yeah, for the chat. Yeah. If that's helpful. I don't see any hands raised, so yeah, go right ahead, Chris. Thanks. Perfect. Um, I, I want to acknowledge first, uh, Mitch, you sent in some, some really good questions. I'm going to try and respond to that in the chat, unless, Peter, you know off the top of your head how many kilometers of sea ice has been lost in the past 30 years. Um, uh, not in, in kilometers, but it's 15% uh, in the last 10 years of the global ice cover in uh, September, which is the sea ice mini. Yeah, it's scary stuff. It depends on also, uh, so oh. I did a lot of sea ice research. I can spend three hours talking about sea ice, but <laughs> there's uh, different kinds of sea ice. There's uh, thin first year ice that melts off every summer and then grows back in the fall. And then we have the most important sea ice is the multi-year ice, ice that survives summer melt and keeps growing in thickness over the years and can become eight to 12 years old before it's either a spit out of the Arctic by ocean currents or get pulverized by ridging and turn into smaller ice and melt. So that old multi-year ice is some of the most important ice for habitat and ecosystems. And that ice has gone away by over 50% in the last 10 years. That ice is almost gone now in the Arctic. So there's very little old multi-year ice left in the Arctic Ocean altogether. And that ice is absolutely critical for seals, uh, polar bears, or an, any living ecosystem function. Yeah, pretty dramatic. Yeah. Yes. And for me, that leads to a transitional question, and I'll, I'll, I'll just close on my own because um, I, I, you know, it does point to the work that you're stepping into, um, which I'm particularly excited about, and I think folks on this call are supported our work throughout different capacities, or are certainly invested in. 
Um, you know, I'm, I'm curious to, as you step into this new role with such a focus on the Arctic, you know, what is the biggest area of hope for you um, in, in working through some of our campaigns and just viewing the landscaping across mm -hmm. Alaska? I think there's a lot of hope. It's easy to get caught in this uh, uh, doom and gloom cycle uh, uh, with the, you know, the severe climate change effects on Alaska. My cabin here in, in Alaska is tipping over currently because of melting permafrost under it. It's leaning heavily, so I need to do something about that. Uh, these, we see these effects on a daily basis. Uh, so it's easy to end up in that uh, all hope is lost. Uh, I have a very different view uh, both by working with uh, the strong people up here, resilient people, and also studying the ecosystems and their ability to adapt and, and be resilient to change. Uh, so my, my big hope is that the work we do at AWL, whether it's Tongas with old growth forest, the refuge, MPRA, uh, our biggest uh, sort of playing card we can play is to do everything we can to make sure that there's not additional pressures on these ecosystems. So climate change alone is, is such a big, rapid, uh, impactful change, and the ecosystems have the ability to adapt to that and build resilience. But what really brings them over the tipping point is if you add additional stresses on there, and that could be, for instance, industrial development, um, uh, any infrastructure or anything that's disruptive on top of climate change. So that multiplicative effect is really what can tip ecosystems into being non-functional. So I'm really excited about the work we're doing and trying to safeguard whole continuous ecosystems and wilderness areas. That's really key for, for dealing with some of the climate change issues and remain keep these uh, areas from the, uh, to keep them wild and healthy ecosystems. So uh, I, think, I think that's why I started off by saying it's such a privilege to work on these issues. It's, it's uh, I shouldn't say this, but I would probably do this without getting a salary because it's, it's really uh, a fantastic job. And uh, also Chris to work with uh, the supporters of AWL and, and the staff, it's just, uh, yeah, so far in, I'm what, three months in, but it's, it's really been fantastic startup here. Awesome. Yeah, does anybody wanna unmute and ask a question of the audience here? That's, have not seen any hands raised, but you're certainly welcome to I see some questions here in the chat. Uh, can you talk about glacier loss? Um, yeah, quickly. Um, uh, glacier loss in Alaska, around southeast Alaska, is, is uh, dramatic, mostly. Uh, most, nearly all glaciers are losing mass. There's a couple of glaciers that are advancing, and that's due to internal glacier dynamics that I probably can't get into right now. But in overall, uh, glaciers are losing mass at a uh, really rapid uh, pace. Um, for sea level rise, which is a global problem, it used to be that sea level rise was mostly due to warming oceans due to climate change. So warming atmosphere means uh, ocean is warming up and it's expanding due to heating. Nowadays, the number one contributor to global sea level rise is uh, glacier melt from Alaska and Greenland. So uh, those have taken over, unfortunately, the contributing major contributing factors. So what happens here in Alaska and around the Arctic and Greenland uh, now affects everyone on Earth, including people in low-lying uh, areas in Indonesia, if you live in Florida, anywhere near the coastal where you have a sea level rise issue, you, it's mostly due to what happens up here. So. Um, everyone should be concerned about what happens in the Arctic and with climate change, not just because it's affecting my cabin here in Goldstream, but it's affecting everyone around the Earth. Yeah, we're interconnected, the globe. I think I saw that there were more questions coming into the chat. Um, there are, and I don't want to also overlook one that came in very early on and one of the give appreciation for early questions. Uh, but uh, there was a question about, you talk, you spoke about the encounter with bear cubs, um, mm -hmm. sort of shifting gears a little bit. Is there something uh, either perhaps more notable or what could you speak to maybe some of the most surprising or interesting or exciting animal encounter that you've, you've come across in some of your Alaska travels? 
Yeah, polar bears, I would say. Uh, I don't mind bears, running into black bears and grizzly bears. Uh, most people who live up here, uh, we do that occasionally and, and I'm, I have a healthy respect for them, but usually they're as scared as I am and we part ways and that's about it. Polar bears is a whole different ballpark. They just, they just wanna eat you. And uh, no matter what you do. And typically when you're in, in the field, the polar bears I've encountered are hungry young males and they are just really very focused on walking straight up to you and, and uh, having you for breakfast, lunch or dinner or ideally all three. So um, polar bears I have an extremely healthy respect for. I've encountered them both on expeditions working on sea ice where we have polar bear guards that keep an eye out for us. Typically, these are Inuit uh, men who are ridiculously good at spotting wildlife. We are out there and they said, so have you noticed the five polar bears that have been uh, circling us all day? And we're like, what polar bears? We had no idea. And then they sit down with us and we take our time being quiet and still. And then they start to point them out one after another. And you're like, holy moly. Uh, so, so, you know, that... Uh, that awareness that people have who live up there with polar bears continuously is just amazing to me. And uh, we've had polar bears come into our camp. Uh, I've had polar bears that ate part of my backpack and tent. And uh, this is even after we put up electric fence around and crackers and all sorts. So uh, polar bears, uh, I love them. I worked a lot with them with WWF, but I also, uh, I am pretty terrified <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be anywhere near. Um, it sounds like a healthy fear. <laughs> yeah, healthy respect, yes. Yeah, it kept yeah, me alive so far. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, and to continue to shift gears a little bit, there's some questions around sort of uh, the league's work. Um, mm -hmm. uh, one is is a question about any shifts that you're seeing uh, that you sort of will be identifying as, as as you continue to step in the role about how the league may change under your leadership. Yeah, I, th I think uh, there's no major uh, 90 degree corner, corner taking that's going to take place anytime soon. The league has been doing amazing work long before I arrived with Adam Colton before me has really set this organization up to be extremely successful, both in D.C. politically and also in our work on, on different campaigns and areas here in Alaska. Um, I would say... Um, I'll, I see a slight change in our deepening uh, respect and work with indigenous communities and people, something I'm personally interested in. My uh, uh, position here being in Fairbanks is good for that too. I, a lot of grassroots organizations are based here in Fairbanks. So I have an easy time to meet people over coffee in person. And uh, I, I do score a few brownie points there where I'm not a DC based person, but to have lived up here and have the same lifestyle, it makes it easy to communicate. And, and typically we spend the first hour or two talking about weather or hunting or, or berries or something exciting before we talk about anything else. So that's sort of a, a good starting point. Uh, also, I think we have, a, we, we have a new strategic plan, which I think it's really healthy for us. It's focused and uh, we're gonna be working in sort of more of a campaign structure at AWL. We have a MPRA campaign that we are starting to fire up and that will be an enormous Denali sized piece of work that we need to do, that we need all your help with. Um, and we're adding some capacity. We're hiring in a communications director. We're hiring in a campaign director. So we're really boosting our capacity where we need it the most. So those are some, some things that you can look forward to here in the near future. Yeah, thank you, Peter. I was gonna ask how you think the physical, physical location of being in Fairbanks will help the work and, and our work with AWL. But yeah, so thanks for touching on that. That was, that was good. I don't know if there's anything more there that you want to cover, but. Sue Mills asked if I worked with Arctic researchers on the Plarstern. Yes, I've been on the Plarstern many times. It's a, a German icebreaker that's uh, focused on research and it makes trips between Antarctica and Arctic every year. And they uh, mostly worked in the Russian side of the Arctic and uh, I've been on the Plarstern. Um, beautiful ship, great 
science being conducted. Uh, my favorite part of that ship is two things. It has a war in inside. There's a water polo court inside the ship. This is a big icebreaker, so you can play water polo. And they also have an authentic Tyrolean beer bar with just German beers, which was much appreciated after long days working on the sea ice. So uh, that's, that's, <laughs> that's a <really> good thing. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't talk anything about like how you roast your own coffee beans and some of that. Um, if you want to touch on some of that. I love coffee. Sweden is the second most coffee drinking country in the world. That's where I grew up. I think Finland is the only one who's got us beat. Um, and here in Alaska with my partner, Jennifer, we uh, import uh, uh, ecologically harvested high elevation coffee from Ecuador, very sustainable green beans. And then we have a tumble roaster and we roast our own coffee and make, I've made it into a full science scale operation where I have the roasting down to perfection and it's three seconds after a second crack on the beans and then we stop and rapidly cool them and I make the best espresso in the world. <laughs> I, just, I want to know if you can ship some of that down to Sitka. <laughs> I can. I'll send I'll send you a, a bag, Debbie. You can you can uh, you can sample. Yeah, that's great. What do, what do you think is your the greatest challenge now that you've been at the helm for three months when you think mm -hmm. about the Arctic and our campaigns and, and where we're going and all your good ideas in your mind, what's the biggest challenge in front of us as far as getting across the finish line and protecting these places we really cherish? Uh, there's a couple of things. Um, the political landscape is extremely challenging. Uh, we're working on that on a daily basis. I've already had a number of meetings with various key senators together with our green CEOs from Nature Conservancy and other uh, NGOs. And those have been impactful, I think. Uh, we Last week, we had the big flying with chiefs from Canada and Alaska, Gwich'in chiefs uh, who did the rounds in the White House and with senators and other key figures also super impactful and I'm glad the AWL was able to help coordinate that flying. Uh, I think one of the biggest indigenous cheap flying's ever occurred, but that was very powerful. So we're doing all the footwork we can on the political side, but it's still, it's still a major challenge. And I think the Ukraine war has unfortunately uh, brought the discussion of gas prices at the pump to something very unhealthy. Uh, it's, it's like, okay, this is what got us to this problem. And now the solution is to do more of the same. Uh, so that's a narrative that's very unfortunate um, for our cause. Uh, bigger, other bigger challenges I would say is, um, is really keeping pace with climate change. So climate change is occurring at the even ra more rapid pace and sometimes legislation and uh, the governmental decision-making process is much slower than climate change. So we're kind of playing catch up. So there's a mismatch on those timescales. And uh, that's hard, hard for me to live with because I wanna, I wanna speed up our work, but at the same time, we also need to do work that's more long-term and slow and meaningful. So there's all these different timescales involved in our work. And uh, thirdly, I would say, MPRA, Willow, the oil and gas project, Willow and others are, are immediate on our radar and uh, AWL will play a crucial important role there to bring a campaign up to full speed and really do everything we can to stop this development. Um, I think the last figures we were able to estimate uh, the emissions from Willow alone would be equal to about 66 large coal power plants. So this is, uh, it's got a beautiful name, Willow, sounds friendly, but it's anything but. Uh, so we have a, we have a big, big heavy lift as an organization to help uh, formulate a, a strong campaign for the MPRA and put any safeguards and regulations on top of there as much as we can. And uh, Debbie the, 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 and others, I think the, the end goal would be to have enough protections that it's insensitive to uh, administration cycle. So even if we have eight years of Republicans, uh, nothing would change. 
and the protections will be long lasting and secure. That's really the end goal. And that's what I want to work on uh, as an organization. To dovetail on that, there was a question in the chat earlier about some of the immediate work, in, in particular, the increased um, threats for, for, for domestic development due to the, the situation in Ukraine and Russia. Um, do you, can you speak to a little bit about sort of, you, I know you had some, some as you were transitioning into this role, some, some interesting and unfortunate situations as you had folks at WWF based out of there that you were working with. Um, but yes, could you speak to a little bit of that as well as sort of your, your the current situation and how the league's responding to that? Yeah, uh, happy to, Chris. Um, well, first of all, I, I was born and raised in Sweden. It's not too far from Russia. And uh, so uh, what's going on in Eastern Europe and Ukraine is, is hitting fairly close to home. Uh, Sweden and Finland is now uh, applying to join NATO as well. So these are, my home country has been a neutral country for hundreds of years. So this is uh, just on a security policy uh, landscape, apart from what we work on here, it's a really, really dramatic change. Um, uh, as I was facing out of WWF and entering into AWL, uh, the Ukraine war started and we had WWF colleagues in Kiev who were sitting in the subway being bombarded by Russian bombs and writing to me and apologizing for not handing in their report on time, which is just, you know, remarkable. <laughs> I said, I think you have other things to worry about currently. And they were just, oh, no, we're fine. It's just the internet is coming in and out in the little spotty. So that tells you something about the resilience of people again in, in times of hardship, how they are still focused and they were adamant about continuing conservation work in Ukraine, even during the war itself. So pretty remarkable. Uh, on the gas prices, uh, there's a lot of false narratives uh, that we need to step on and, and squish if possible. Currently, one of them is that the gas prices at the pump are a reflection of the Ukraine war directly and or inability of the US to produce enough oil domestically. None of these are true. Um, the only true thing is that the oil and gas companies, big oil, have made record profits uh, during this war and they've been price gauging us all at the pump. So, um, yeah, US exports a lot of oil. We don't need more oil. We need a more equitable way of dealing and ultimately transition as fast as we can away from our dependence on oil and gas. And that's really the long term solution. Uh, easy to say, but there, there needs to be much more work on that. And a no-brainer to me will be to take all the subsidies we give to the oil industry and put them into renewable research and, and projects. And that will go a long way as a start. Thanks for all that. Um, I appreciate you always using the stats. It was always a whole framework for us as well. Um, but there are two other issues, questions on, on areas that are not necessarily seen as the bread and butter work of, of Alaska mm -hmm. Wilderness League. Um, one is focusing on um, a land project or a road project in Eisenbeck National Wildlife Refuge, and another is a road, the Ambler Road. Mm -hmm. to, um, both of which in the league has had some history in working on and, and messaging. Um, there's some curiosity that's around, um, will we be working on some of those issues moving forward? And sort or um, curious, any responses on your end from that? Absolutely. I, Eisenbeck itself has a very personal meaning to me. I did field work out there for many years, uh, working in the lagoon systems of Eisenbeck. Uh, these are uh, world critical lagoon systems. They hold the largest uh, eelgrass beds in the world in, in the Eisenbeck lagoon. These are critical for migratory birds, for salmon, for uh, acting as nurseries, for all sorts of marine wildlife. So it's, it's um, I worked at that for four years in a row, spent a lot of time crisscrossing these areas and it, it just personally means a lot to me. Uh, I've been following the Eisenbeck Road issue for a long, long time. And the, the unfortunate truth is that this is a, a Trump era ruling with judges who managed to get this ruling forward. And we're fighting that back with the various legal terms such as on bonk, which I recently learned about, which is now being pushed. And we also had the fortunate uh, pleasure of having uh, former President Jimmy Carter sign a letter in this regard. And we worked with Peter Fontaine, who's a lawyer 
from Anchorage who helped push that. So I think we're we're doing all we can on the Eisenbeck ruling. And most people don't know where Eisenbeck is or maybe won't even care so much if a little road is built through a wilderness area and, and the national refuge. But the problem is that it has implications for all of Alaska, that ruling. And uh, now if that goes through, you can build roads into Denali National Park and build a big lodge if you say that uh, uh, the economical interests are big enough. So this has enormous implications for all of Alaska. So uh, we're watching that and helping as much as we can. Uh, similarly with Ambler Road, Ambler Road is um, still up there uh, hovering in the, uh, in the <laughs> in the atmosphere, uh, we were able to get, uh, with your help and others, a ton of signatures for the Ambler Road and pushing back. I think, Louis, if you can remind me, 200,000 signatures, I think. Yes, just over, actually, yeah. Yeah, which yeah. is almost a quarter of a million signatures, which is just remarkable. So um, well, there's been pushback there. Uh, both Ambler Road and Eisenbeck and Pebble Mine and Bristol Bay and all these other issues are all important. I think I will with our new strategic plan, we're going to focus on MPRA and the refuge and then 30 by 30, which is the common goal or America the Beautiful, as President Biden calls it, which is basically trying to preserve on land and in the ocean 30% by 2030. And I think Eisenbeck, Ambler, all these issues can, can gently be folded in under the 30 by 30 umbrella and framework, and we can work on them as needed. And one of our strengths at AWL is that we, as AWL, we don't need to do everything, but we can act as a glue and as a, a come together focal point for other NGOs and people and partnerships and organizations to really be powerful. So we can be a summoner, so we can do things in concert. And I think that's a strength we have and something we should uh, utilize going forward. I hope that helps. Yeah, and continue talking about these lands we're trying to protect as solutions to the climate crisis. I mean, they're absolutely the answer to some of the sequestration and other things that we need to do is at moving mm -hmm. forward. So yeah, it's it's really important to continue. While being informed by science. So as a scientist, I'm, yes. I'm a big, big fan of uh, putting science up there because We've done the science on most of the ecosystem change. We understand climate change fairly well these days. Our models are doing pretty well predicting what's going to happen. Actually, the climate models still pretty well in 1917 when they were in their infancy of predict, predicting that there will be polar amplification of climate change. And since then, uh, oil and gas and other industries have basically put that under the carpet and say, we didn't know this, we didn't know, but we've known this for a, for a very, very long time. Yeah, thank you everyone for what a wonderful conversation tonight. It's been very fun to talk to Peter about all of his adventures and also about the future and what we're gonna be expecting. I don't know if there's any last questions. We're getting close to the hour here. I'm happy so, to take some bonus ones if there are some. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and lastly, too, you're always welcome to contact me. Uh, you have my email, I hope, and also my cell phone. Please text or call or email me anytime. I'd be happy to have a conversation. Thank you, Chris. Yep, there was one question uh, sort of related to the new talk uh, situation. And Patricia, I see it. I will uh, follow up with you. Um, I'll just call that out there. Um, is there anything else? I think I. From my end, I think we've covered pretty much everything that was addressed here. I'm personally happy that that we got to see as many people on this, um, as many familiar new faces to connect with Peter, a, a new but increasingly familiar face for all of us at the league. Um, and just wanted to express our gratitude for, for everyone who's been able to sign on for tonight. Thank you, everyone. This is awesome. I'm glad to see you all and uh, hope to see you soon again. Yeah, thank you so much. Hi, Lois. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Jenny. <laughs> Hello. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Peter. Hi, everybody. Thanks, Debbie. <laughs> Thank you, Peter, for joining us. We really need you, and I'm so grateful that you're here. Thanks so much. Hey, do Peter. Hey, do
And thanks, Chris and Louis, for your help. That was great. Yeah, yes. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, thanks for sharing. That was fun. And good to see you, Debbie. It's been a while. Yeah, uh, I'm going to be in uh, Fairbanks on the, I think it's the 17th, for a few days, coming up for actually a memorial service. But oh. I'll, be there. I'll be there for a few days, though, so maybe we can get together for coffee. Please uh, drop me a message so I keep me up to date and I'll meet up with you. First coffee is on me. I'll serve you some of mine. <laughs> yeah, I want, I just, got back, I just got back, you know, from Ecuador recently and I, uh, their, their coffee was amazing down there. So mm -hmm. yeah, I'm definitely going to take you up on the Ecuadorian coffee. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's the best we've found. It's also from small scale farmer that I know, I, I have his picture, I know his name. It's like a direct line. It's it's sort of a very few middle hands, and I think most of the money goes straight into the pocket. So it feels pretty good. It's great. Yeah, yeah. Well, I guess I'll close up now. Um, Sounds good, Luis. Yep. We'll see you guys. Have a good good rest of your evening. Yeah. Thanks. Good job, Bye. 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 Bye.